Hi, everyone. If you could please have a seat, we'll get started very shortly. Otherwise, lunch will be at dinner time. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. Um, my name is Sue Hardin, and I am a member of the Biodiversity for a Livable Climate staff. Uh, I would like to present a very brief framework for what we are looking at and what we will be looking at in more detail with the com coming panelists. The eco-restoration work that we are proposing and that has been carried out so successfully, as you've already heard, comes about at the intersection of climate, ecosystems, and biodiversity. Uh, I am going to use as a framework someone that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that is Danella Meadows. Uh, she it was a systems person and did systems thinking. However, the, the uh, source of this is called the dance, dancing with systems. We can never fully understand our world. We can't find a proper sustainable relationship to nature if we try to do it from the role of omniscient conqueror. I think we've seen evidence of that everywhere, haven't we? The future is being envisioned and brought lovingly into being. We can't control the systems or figure them out, but we can dance with them. The first thing that Donella says is get the beat. Before you disturb a system, find out how it behaves. Starting with the behavior of systems will direct our thoughts not only to what's wrong, but how did we get here? And if we don't change direction, where are we going to end up? Number two, listen to the wisdom of the system. Aid and encourage the forces and the structures that help the system run itself. It is self-organizing. Before you charge in to make things better, pay attention to the value of what's there. Three, stay humble. Be a humble learner. System thinking requires that one pays more attention to, to intuition than to rationales. The thing to do when you don't know is not to bluff and not to freeze, but to learn. We learn by experiment, or as Buckminster Fuller said, by trial and error and error and error. Expand our time horizons. The official time horizon of our society doesn't extend be be beyond what the next election. However, we know that many Native American cultures actively spoke of and considered their decisions to affect the seventh generation to come. The longer the operant time horizon, the better are the chances for survival. Next. Expand the boundary of caring. Living successfully in a world of complex systems means, above all, expanding the horizons. Real systems are interconnected. Nothing in the human race can be separate from our global ecosystem, otherwise known as the biosphere. We should celebrate complexity and diversity. For us, this means, in this paradigm, biodiversity. Let's face it, the universe is messy. It's nonlinear. It's turbulent. It's chaotic. It's dynamic. It spends its time in transient behavior on its way to somewhere else. It self-organizes and evolves. It creates biodiversity, not uniformity. That's what makes the world beautiful, and that's what makes the world work. Donella Meadows stated, when you understand the power of self-organization, you begin to understand why biologists worship 
biodiversity, even more than economists worship technology. I have to say that in my little blurb there, it says that I have a lifelong passion for biodiversity. But in doing the research for this presentation, I said, when did I first learn about it? Hmm. It wasn't coined until 1985. I'd been married 10 years by then. I'd been teaching for more than that. But as a biologist, I respond exactly what, what she's saying. We're madly in love with that. And that's at the core, I think, of our passion. Uh, biodiversity, I have to show you, I called several libraries and I asked for a book called The Ants. And they said, well, that's in the children's section, one after another. No, The Ants by Bert Halldobler and e. Edward O. Wilson is this volume. I would bring it in to my students all the time and say, biodiversity, here you are. Can you believe that this is about ants? But more than that, I shock them when I let them know that every time E.O. Wilson would go out to his studies in the forests and in the ecosystems that he studied, he came back with new species identified. Every time. It's incredible. For me, the biodiversity issue right now is reaching such an onslaught that it frequently brings me to tears. I used to bring monarch butterfly cocoons home all the time and then nurture them and take them to class or show them to my sons. When I've told people recently that I saw three live monarch butterflies this summer, three, they were amazed. This is sick. I'm sorry, but it's sick that we could let this happen. And that's not to mention bees. These are crimes against the environment, crimes against biodiversity, and it's horrific. We at Biodiversity for a Livable, Parad for a Livable Climate envision this paradigm shift. Earth, the biosphere, our planetary ecosystem is self-organizing. Given the time, the basic ingredients, extensive restoration efforts on our part, especially at the lowest levels of the biosphere, the Earth can self-organize. It is, in fact, according to Meadows, the goal of any system, any ecosystem, including the biosphere, to be resilient and to survive. So we're not out there to make it happen. We're there to help enable these things to happen. In conclusion, Donella Meadows writes, and so we are brought to the gap between understanding and implementation. Systems thinking can lead us to the edge of what analysis can do, and then point beyond to what can and must be done by the human spirit. This panel that is about to start uh, is going to bring us to the implementation of eco-restoration in many diverse ways. And I hope that this framework will help us to kind of pull these threads together and hold on to them. So let's begin with uh, water follows, carbon follows water. We have Judy Schwartz and we have Tom Garreau. I'm not going to introduce Tom Garreau again. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. Judy uh, is very meaningful to me because the reason I got involved in this is that I saw this poster, Cows Save the Planet. And I'm in an argument with my brother at the time about beef and all that sort of thing. And I said, I've got to go to this. I went to the presentation at the library. I came back with Adam's card, and here I am. So uh, that's Judy, and Judy has done so much in so many places dealing with the water cycle from the bottom up. So we'll have Judy first. Thank you. <laughs> 